Hi, I'm Nicole Johnson, and this is Diabetes Partners, a Type We program. In this course, we're gonna be talking about communication and diabetes. In a family environment, communication is critical to living well and living productively. In this session, you're gonna see our people with diabetes and our people without diabetes separate into two groups and talk about the different types of things that worry them, the things that frustrate them, and the things that they wish for. This is all leading up to a session about how to take the blame out of conversations related to diabetes and how to put in support, love, and reinforcement. What are the challenges um, in family life because of diabetes? What have you experienced so far? Jonathan? Um, I guess I'll start off. But um, I've noticed the, the biggest thing for me is your loved one gets to complain and be upset about diabetes and have all these issues and lows and highs and be upset. But it almost feels like as the spouse, you cannot complain because mm. you're not checking your blood okay. 10 times. Yeah. You're not. You know, you're not living, you know, with the disease, even though we are. And if, like, I gripe that, you know, it's frustrating for me as well, it's almost like, are you serious right now? You know? Right. Like, yeah. You're not living with it. You're not living with yeah. it. I'm the one living with it. Oh, okay. And people don't understand that it takes, you know, maybe not as much of a toll, but it mm -hmm. takes a huge toll on us as well. Um, so that's part of my biggest thing right there. You almost feel guilty if you're complaining because they are the ones that are having to check their blood like we've been doing all day and, and monitoring their levels and, and watching everything that they eat. Um, I think also uh, when they get into those lows or those highs, especially the lows, they get real irritable. And uh, so that's kind of difficult to deal with as well. So, you know, I just yeah. almost become silent and, okay, deal with it. And, um, you know, if there's anything I can do, great. If not, I'm just going to be over here and, and not interfere. So so that it can get better and hopefully get a little bit more normal attitude. <laughs> okay. It's almost trying to decipher, mm -hmm. is it a low blood sugar or high blood sugar that's causing the irritability or uh, did we just mess up? I mean, we're guys, we're gonna mess up. So did I mess up or is this one of those times um, that you, know, you actually need some help and you need us just to bite our tongue for a little while? You know, I think uh, we've been talking a lot about what, how it affects us, but also it affects my family as well. Like when they're coming in, my in-law or her in-laws, you know, my father, mother, they don't really know as much about it as we do by any means. So constantly making comments, it kind of gets a little old, like, oh, is she able to eat that? You know, is this going to be good? Where do we need to go to dinner? It's like, we've got it under control. You know, let us be. We deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's the extended family as well on that misinformation, like you said, and, and, and lack of information for them, lack of, uh, you know, training or, or what have you. And I think this is kind of the whole point of, of this exercise a little bit is, Getting people to know a little bit more about the disease, um, you know, 90% of the material out there is about type 2, and mm -hmm. it's such a different disease, and people don't, I don't believe, really realize that unless they do live with it on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's with the disease or, or being the spouse or significant other. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Yeah, and it sounds like your uh, comment there actually is getting to our second question, which is what can make your life better? Um, I know for me, going with the technology, um, just, you know, switching to a pump. We were first on shots, switching to a pump helped a lot. Um, okay. And then getting a Dexcom so we can see trends. And now, you know, we can even get, you know, the monitors on our phones. And I know we were all had our phones out earlier comparing. Um, but being able to have those alerts adds an extra level of, of assurance. I know there's, before I could just pull my phone up, if I called and couldn't get an answer after a couple of calls, first thought in my head was, is her sugar low? Is she passed yeah. out on the floor somewhere? Yeah. So now I can at least look and be like, okay, this is not sugar related. She might just be busy or not be around her phone. Um, but that's definitely helped with us a lot. Um, but the, on, the, on the counter end, you also have to balance that because you don't want to seem like you're overbearing, like checking every three seconds, okay. like, hey, you know, you're going high, you're going low, what are you doing? You know, are you correcting this? So it's definitely that, that play where Technology is going to help us, but you need to make sure it doesn't also hurt the relationship and you're not going too far with it. Yeah. And I would just say just be an active participant, you know. Okay. You know, if they're checking their sugars, be there. You know, sometimes they don't want to check their sugars, check it for them. You know, just a simple thing like that where if you can just check their sugar this one time, you know, they'll just look at you like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> you know, or middle of the night, they have a low alarm and yep. they don't have to get up. You get up, you know, every, you know, I'm not saying you get, do it every single time, but if you get up and check and you can correct or whatever, help them out, you know, that little bit will go a long way with them knowing that they have that partner, that active participant and um, just really getting out there and meeting other people in the community that are just like you. I've, I've noticed that that's definitely helped Christina and it's helped me um, just going out there and realizing, hey, we're not the only ones dealing with this. We're not the only ones thinking about this. Um, we've made a ton of wonderful relationships and, and friends through the diabetes community and it really helps to get out there and advocate for, for ourselves and um, just meet people and just you know, be able to just sit down and you know, everybody just pulls out their pumps and you don't feel like a weird, like the weirdo of the group, you know? Um, or you hear an alarm and you're like, oh, someone needs to check, you know? It's, it, it definitely makes you feel a part of something and definitely helps, makes you a little more sane. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even today has been pretty eye-opening for myself. I was co uh, commenting earlier how all, you know, I see four or five different people bringing out their testers and, and checking their blood and watching their pumps. We all have our Dexcom alerts on and, uh, you know, getting up in the middle of the night is a great thing for, you know, you hear those alarms go off. And uh, again, just being there for them is, is making both of your lives better because you feel part of the, of the solution as well. Now that we've heard from our diabetes partners, the guys, let's see what their wives have to say about what they wish for from their partner and what would help them feel more supported in their quest, their journey with type 1 diabetes. I think something that can be frustrating, um, maybe not necessarily with my immediate family or my husband, but if I'm out with a group of friends that may not know um, the details about type 1, um, when they said, oh, can you have that if you're at a birthday party or if you're at a party? Like, oh, don't, don't give her any cake because she's, you know, she's a diabetic. And, you know, sometimes yeah. you're like, well, you don't, you don't know if I can and you don't know the details of that and what I can and can't have. So sometimes it can get frustrating when it's publicly announced whether you can or cannot have something or, you know, be careful. And Yeah, misunderstanding. That happens a lot. Yes. Who else has something? Well, with the with the Dexcom that I think we all have and with the share, maybe I should be careful of who ah. I'm sharing with <laughs> because I get text messages. You're 50 and dropping juice. And it's like, what? you're in Orlando. Like I'm here, I know what I'm doing. Like I promise. So sometimes I think like, though I know it's just a helpful little, um, you know, message, but mm -hmm. you know, I think that sometimes the concern, you know, they, you know, I, I do know I, I've got it under control, but sometimes they're like, are you okay? Are you okay? And do you test your blood? What's your blood sugar's been? You know, so. So what could make your life better related to diabetes and related to family, specifically your partnership? Um, I'll, I'll say for me, um, one of the things that has really helped between my husband and I is he has really uh, gone out of his way to show that he can empathize with me. He's he's worn every device I've ever had, he's put on his body. He's worn a Dexcom for a whole week. He put an Omnipod on, you know, with saline wow. in it. I even did like a a trial with a tubed pump. He he wore it when when I was done with that, you know, trying to just just to see, just to see. what it was like to have something stuck on his body and yeah. and to me that was like priceless, that he was A, willing to do it, and B, could at the end of the day say, like, this sucks, you mm -hmm. know, and I'm sorry that you have to do this every day. Mm -hmm. And he would go through the motions and test his sugar, and, you know, he still had to calibrate the Dexcom, and mm -hmm. um, and he really, I mean, that that to me was was probably the, the best thing he could do, because then I, I know that he has some little glimpse, I mean, no, he doesn't feel what it feels like to go low or be high right. or anything, but even just having this thing stuck to you that you can't get rid of is huge. I mean. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's really cool. I think with my, with, with my husband and I would be, he understanding when I do feel shaky, when I'm low, yeah. my mood is, I mean, you, just you, stay away from me. Free right. And he, it, it took a time, but he understands that. So he knows that the, you know, when I'm short with him or snappy, um, it's, he does not take it personally. He knows it's because I'm having a low and he kind of, you know, helps walk me through it yeah. or, you know, 
Good. Very supportive. So he understands the the mood swings for sure. Yes. And yeah. when I'm high, if I'm not feeling well, you know, um, I think that he's learning not to try to push me to, you know, when I'm, you know, if I'm really high, like it's probably not best that I go for a three mile walk. Right. When exactly. you're super high and he understands, he's, it's so understanding so for sure understand, with, that, not, with know, the highs and lows. pushing you. Right. Now that we've heard from both the men and the women, it's time to bring in Dr. Mario Rodriguez, a licensed clinical psychologist, to help us put all of these pieces together and make sure that we're creating environments with the proper communication skills so that everyone feels heard, validated, and appreciated. There are a couple of things that we talk about when we talk about support. Um, the most obvious thing, I think, is the personal experience of having an interaction with someone that makes you feel cared for, appreciated, understood, uh, you're not alone. So it's a very interpersonal dynamic, support. But we also talk about things like support network, your social network. So you think about your family, your parents, your siblings, your friends, your coworkers. Somebody mentioned earlier about having your neighbors be a part of the team, right? That if you're not around your spouse uh, with diabetes, that you can maybe call your neighbor and say, can you please go, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. So building a good support network is an important part of support, something we might overlook. Availability of material aid is kind of the, the basic, can you do this for me? Or do you have a candy in your pocket? Or can you run and get some test strips? And kind of the practical stuff the everyday mundane stuff, but that's very helpful. The interpersonal part I mentioned earlier, having somebody to talk to about everything, not just, you know, uh, I'm a little low, or can we wait for, you know, a meal, or those kinds of things, but the feelings, the thoughts, the challenges, the stressors, the negative stuff that you guys came up with here. Um, and then lastly, uh, overall marital adjustment. A strong sense of support is a crucial element of marital adjustment, marital satisfaction, marital longevity. Uh, when partners don't feel supported or connected to their spouse, that's a bad sign as far as relationships go. It uh, you know, sometimes spells doom. Some other studies have shown that when people with diabetes feel well supported, when they have a sense that they're not alone, um, a lot of good things happen. They tend to have better adjustment to their illness and as a result, better outcomes as well. Um, fewer hospitalizations, fewer complications and things like that. So there's, there's two main things. One is they do a better job of taking care of themselves and they have better outcomes with their diabetes. So if it isn't enough to have a good relationship, what about the health aspect of it? Really important. So there's this guy named John Gottman, who is a psychologist who's been doing research on marital relationships, predicting divorce, marital adjustment for like 30, 40 years. So in their model, they talk about three main areas of marital um, adjustment. Uh, conflict management, being able to work out problems, being able to negotiate and so forth. Friendship, intimacy, uh, and positive affect. That's what I'm seeing right now. Hands being held, arms around each other, uh, feeling connected in a positive way. And then lastly, shared meanings and goals. And this is coming together and sharing the same dreams, having a family, understanding what the other person's goals are and supporting them in that. Unfortunately, we're not gonna be able to talk about all of this today. <laughs> we're gonna focus on conflict management. Step number one, <laughs> listening and validation. Very difficult to have support if you don't listen. Very difficult to support someone if they don't share with you what they need. <laughs> so in order to have support, which we know is so important, uh, and in order to be understood, we have to communicate effectively. Step number two, mutual understanding. When you were talking as, as separate groups about the things that help and the things that are more challenging, one of the things that the, the, uh, the person with diabetes said was being understood. Um, well, I thought it was very interesting to hear from the partners of the people with diabetes that they also would like to be understood. So mutual understanding is, is the key, going both ways. Uh, and then step number three, compromising and problem solving. When a couple has a conflict, a disagreement, a misunderstanding, competing needs, 
Um, how you handle that, of course, is very important, not only for the rest of your day, <laughs> but in general for the strength of your relationship. Criticism, when you use you statements, right, that can come across as critical. People get defensive. Uh, so criticism is a very common problem when we're trying to um, communicate with our partners about something that's a, an issue. Uh, contempt. Contempt can take a lot of different forms. Name calling might be the most obvious example. But uh, other things like making jokes, you know, um, mocking the person, and man, and, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. The defensiveness that we mentioned a moment ago. It's not my fault. I didn't ask for this, you know. You need to do what you need to do, whatever the, the situation may be. So being defensive. Um, and then lastly, stonewalling. It's the shutting down. It's the walking away. It's the not responding. Um, the storming off uh, kind of response. Uh, stonewalling. So those are the four horsemen of the apocalypse. So here are some antidotes to the four horsemen. For criticism, using gentle startup. Now remember, the speaker is the person who need, has something to say. A request, maybe expressing an emotion or a need. So they're usually the ones who start the conversation. If they start it with you, 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 right? Criticism, you get the defensiveness. Instead, start with something gentle. With criticism comes defensiveness. When that happens, the, the antidote is basically to stop for a minute, walk in their shoes, wherever that was here, and try to understand where they're coming from. Contempt, as we said earlier, the belittling, name calling, mocking, making a joke about it, that kind of stuff. So taking responsibility saying, you're right, I, I did that, I made that mistake, I could do that better you have a valid point. That's the taking responsibility. Showing appreciation is for contempt. I know you mean well. Um, I can see you're trying. I know it's hard. You're doing a great job. Those kinds of ways of expressing appreciation. And then the antidote to stonewalling is self-soothing, which basically means take a few moments to kind of calm yourself down. Take a few deep breaths. If necessary, say, can we talk about this in a few, min a few minutes? I need a little time. Some skills that we can pull out of all of this stuff. Uh, using soft startup instead of criticizing. Criticism being one of the four horsemen. Accepting influence is basically being open to your partner's request or their perspective. Let me try to walk in your shoes and see if I can understand where you're coming from. Making effective repairs during conflict refers to the little things that you can do sometimes in a conversation to help the other person feel better about it. Maybe it's physical, maybe it's a statement along the lines of, I get it, or that's a good point, I didn't think about it. Um, those little things can go a long way to keeping the communication positive. De-escalating quarrels. The um, self-soothing goes a long way here when you start to th see things heating up, right? Maybe in yourself or maybe in your partner, uh, trying to de-escalate. I can see you're upset. Or, as I said earlier, I need a minute. Or, if you're good at it, <laughs> making a, 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 you know, a humorous remark that you know is not gonna be taken as a put down or a criticism. You know, little things like that sometimes work very well. Uh, but the idea is to try to keep it in a good place. Once it starts getting up here, that's when the ugly stuff starts happening, the contempt, the criticism, the stonewalling, and so on. Compromise, that's kind of the bottom line, right? As I said earlier, the idea is not to solve every conflict. Some conflicts are not really solvable because you have a difference of opinion. It's really how to manage the conflict how to communicate in a way that lets you get to some middle ground, some compromise that works for both of you. It requires some give and take, um, but that's a crucial piece here is compromise. And then the physiological soothing, as I mentioned earlier, you might find that there are little things besides just taking a few deep breaths that help calm you down. Maybe it's holding hands or um, hugging first. You know, you mentioned, uh, giving your partner a kiss goodnight and saying I love you even though you've just been in conflict. 
those little things, whatever they may be, and you kind of have to, you know, discover that on your own as, as a partner, as a relationship. Sometimes it can be physiological self-soothing, deep breathing, <laughs> getting away from the situation, change of venue, uh, relaxation, those kinds of things. And sometimes they're more kind of day-to-day -day small gestures, physical, affection, verbal, whatever it may be, but trying to keep things down and low. Okay, um, I wanted to just end with this concept uh, to kind of wrap it all together. And again, as I said earlier, trying to apply all of this stuff, not only to your relationship in general, but in the context of having diabetes in your marriage, in your relationship, in your family. The idea is that support is super important. You know, it's reflected here. You've all spoken about it today. Um, support is not very likely if communication is missing or not effective. So good communication leads to good support. Good support leads to good diabetes self-management, better outcomes, and maybe in the long run, most importantly, the strength of the relationship. So that's a nice little thing to remember. Communication, support, good stuff. That concludes this course, and we hope that you found this information valuable. The key is communication, creating environments where everyone feels safe, everyone feels heard, and everyone feels supported. Partners and people with diabetes have different needs, and both sets of needs need to be voiced in positive ways so that we can create the best family experiences possible. And when we create that, then we have the best diabetes outcomes. We didn't cover everything in this session, so if you would like more information, we encourage you to visit with a certified diabetes educator near you, ask questions, find out more, and find ways to create your best diabetes life possible.